Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first event of the academic year uh, for the project on Shiism and Global Affairs here at Harvard University's Weatherhead Center uh, for International Affairs. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, this will be the first in a, in a series of events uh, and in addition to a conference later in, in, in the spring semester that we're planning where we will delve into and look at, at various aspects of, of Shiism and the manifestation of Shiism across different disciplines uh, from politics and geopolitics to uh, Shia diaspora communities in the West, uh, Africa, uh, Shiism across the world, uh, Shia philosophy and diversity and pluralism uh, within Shiism and interfaith dialogue. Uh, our first event today, uh, uh, I'm very pleased to, to um, uh, uh, announce our, our moderator, present our moderator, Ali Asani, uh, Professor uh, Asani on, on the subject, uh, the event uh, being on sectarianism in Pakistan, uh, a significant subject, uh, especially with the, re the, the very recent exclusivist episodes uh, that uh, we witnessed in uh, Pakistan. Uh, professor Asani is the professor of Indo-Muslim and Islamic religion and cultures uh, here at uh, Harvard University. Uh, he is also a uh, co-chair of the project on Shiism and global affairs uh, here at the Weatherhead Center. Uh, very recently, uh, Professor Asani was also awarded uh, the Harvard Foundation Faculty of the Year Award and was appointed the, the Murray A. Albertson Professor of Middle Eastern Studies uh, here at Harvard as well. Uh, so congratulations to you, uh, Ali. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll hand over uh, the platform to you uh, and uh, to begin the event. Thank you again so much. Okay. Um, Thank you, Payam, for um, organizing this event. And I uh, welcome everyone to this uh, panel discussion. Um, so uh, before, we, uh, before um, we start, I wanted to just introduce our panelists first. Uh, so we have with us um, uh, Professor Hassan Abbas, who is a Distinguished Professor of International Relations at the Near East South Asia Strategic Studies Center at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. He is uh, um, he's an, he's affiliated and advises on the project of on our project on Shiism and Global Affairs, um, which is here at the Weatherhead Center, and he's also a senior fellow at the Center for. Uh, global Policy, a think tank that focuses on the inter intersection of U.S. foreign policy and Muslim geopolitics. Um, his current research focuses on building narratives for countering political and religious extremism and uh, law enforcement reforms in, development, in developing states. Uh, he has had uh, a distinguished career. Uh, serving as professor and department chair at the National Defense University's College of International Security, as well as the distinguished Kaide Azam professor at Columbia University. And he's had, of course, various connections with Harvard, um, including with the Harvard Law School's uh, Islamic Legal Studies program and the program in negotiation, as well as the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard's Kennedy School. So welcome, Hassan. Our uh, second speaker is uh, Noshin Ali, a sociologist serving as global faculty in residence at the Gallatin School, New York University. Uh, she researches uh, state ma making, ecology, and Muslim cultural politics in South Asia with a focus on Pakistan and Kashmir. Uh, She's the author of a recent book, Delusional States, A Feeling, Rule, and Development in Pakistan's Northern Frontier, which was published by Cambridge University Press. So welcome, Nosheen. Um, and then our third speaker is um, Bina Sarver, uh, 
a freelance journalist and documentary filmmaker from Pakistan who focuses on human rights, media, gender, and democracy issues, as well as India-Pakistan and South Asia relations. She has held uh, senior editorial positions in Pakistan in the print and broadcast media. Uh, she was, she's also had a Harvard connection through the Neiman Fellowship Program, as well as the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Kennedy School of Government. And she has taught journalism uh, at Harvard, at Brown, Princeton, as well as Emerson College. So welcome, Bina. Nice. So, um, so just to get started, so the way the format's going to work is that each speaker will have about uh, 10 minutes to speak. And then after that, we will uh, open it for questions uh, that are coming from the audience, but also uh, if you have, if the panelists have questions for each other too, you know, I'd welcome that as well. So, you know, we'll keep it flexible. So maybe after you've talked and if you feel you wanted to ask questions or something to each other, we can have that and then we'll open it up to the, uh, to the audience. So I wanted to start um, uh, the, uh, the topic today um, by first of all, with two caveats. One is the term sectarianism that we are using today for this, um, for this presentation. So strictly speaking, you know, uh, sectarianism, as many scholars have pointed out, is actually uh, not in a, is a term that emerges from the Christian tradition, where there's an idea of a, of a central church uh, that is considered to be orthodox. And then there are all these offshoots, the sects that are seen as, uh, as uh, that are seen as sects and somehow heretical. And somehow this model has been sort of transposed onto contemporary thinking about Islam, even though we know that uh, in, its, in its formation and evolution, uh, Islam, did not have a central church per se. And, you know, you had rather different communities of interpretations. And so I wanted to sort of start with that caveat that even though we're, it's become popular to use this term, maybe as a, maybe it's just a label of convenience, um, but historically speaking, you know, I don't think, you know, this term itself is problematic, but I had to, I wanted to start that out at the beginning, you know, because uh, it may also be relevant to our our um, conversations. And the second thing I wanted to point out is that um, the founding of Pakistan, it's interesting, the founder of Pakistan, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, uh, who, um, you know, was very clear and, you know, he was, you know, in the, in the coming, in the, in the, in the buildup to the whole Pakistan movement and the, the creation of Pakistan, he was very clear that Pakistan is not going to be a theor theocratic state uh, to be ruled by priests with a divine mission. And these are, you know, quotes from his works. We have many non-Muslims, Hindus, Christians, Parsis, but they're all Pakistanis. And so he really had this vision of an inclusive Pakistan that it was not just for Muslims and it was for uh, people of all different religious traditions, but he was also very clear that, um, that, you know, that you could belong to any religion or creed or caste. Uh, it was not the business of the state. And uh, ironically, um, he himself, even though he's of course called Kaide Azam, uh, you know, his detractors uh, used to call him Kafir Azam, the great infidel, partially because he came from a Shia background, but also because he was trained and educated in the West. And, you know, people couldn't accept that, you know, those credentialing. So there was this label Kafir Azam. So you know, it's, a, it's an interesting thing that the very founder uh, the founding father of Pakistan has had to deal with this with this label of kafir. Uh, in any case, so I just wanted to make those few comments at the beginning, and then uh, I'm just going to now start with um, uh, with uh, I'll turn it over to Hassan, 
uh, if you want to share with us your comments. Thank you so much, Professor Isani, for um, your kind introduction and, and for framing the issue in some ways. And I'm thankful to Payam um, for, for, for leading this project um, and for giving us this opportunity. Um, I'm planning to focus in my 10 minutes um, on the policy perspective or looking at it from a pure policy angle. However, Professor Ali has um, raised two points which, which I want to just touch upon briefly to, to set the stage also. He, I think, Professor, you're so right about um, that this whole uh, notion of this, this sectarianism. Um, in, in Pakistan and um, in the region also, I must add, this is a very um, politically correct phrase as well. Because um, even if any specific minority is getting beaten up, they're getting targeted, they're getting killed, if suicide bombing is attacking them, um, if you'll ask somebody, they'll say, this is sectarianism. Well, sectarianism against whom? Um, so it can be anti-Barelvi, it can be anti-Shia, it can be anti-Hindu or, or some group, uh, but so call it sectarianism and it explains that everyone is involved. Everyone is against everyone else. So uh, you're so right. This, this not only that this has a different context um, in, in South Asia, especially in Pakistan, this phrase has been misused. The other way this phrase has been misused uh, is always saying uh, this religious extremism, this comes from Taliban and Afghanistan. We have nothing to do with them. They are far away. They are a different, uh, from a different uh, uh, planet. Or to say, um, this is Iran versus Saudi Arabia. How convenient, how easy uh, to, to just shift the blame on anyone else because in our core, we argue, no, no, they, they, this can't get so wrong in Pakistan. So you, you, your phrase just reminded me of that. And also how much, how far Pakistan has come out from the idea of its founding fathers. Jinnah, as you have rightly said, and I was reminded um, uh, that Jinnah was called by the religious extremists and all the religious extremists who are having a field day in Pakistan today, by the way, they were all against the creation of Pakistan. Most of them, 90% of them. And they used to call Jinnah kafir azam they all knew Jinnah is a, is a uh, Shia Isna Shri. But that was not the reason they were calling him Kafir. They were calling him Kafir or infidel because of their political differences. It's so interesting that despite the religious party's hatred for Jinnah or this political elite, which was modernist, pluralist, progressive, still knowing even about this, the sectarian difference, um, they were not calling him that or framing it as a, as a Shia or Sunni issue. Um, Pakistan was redefined by General Ziaul Haq, and most of what we see today um, is a consequence of that. I leave it to my other esteemed colleagues to, to pick on, but, but you raised such so important, important questions that I thought I'll, I'll briefly mention. Um, so the focus um, of my uh, thoughts today are, are, are in reference to what has been happening in Pakistan for the last two to three months. I'll frame it broadly in a broad fashion, but um, just two examples to explain. Um, the view is, and st articles have started coming up in Pakistani media and elsewhere, that there is this resurgence of sectarianism. Uh, again, uh, uh, now after having um, said what we said about sectarianism, but I can't think of any other word to explain uh, this challenge. But so the sectarianism means the Shia Sunni context um, or conflict um, or rivalry is, is again, raising its ugly head. Um, and it, this was reflected by one thing which has stayed in my mind and I cannot um, really figure it out how to frame it. Uh, something that has happened in Pakistan in an unprecedented fashion that recently in a major procession in Karachi, uh, there were people who raised slogans in favor of Yazid. Um, so those of the audience who are not familiar with him, he's the, I can safely say Yazid Ibn Mawiyah Ibn Abu Sufyan was the most hated figure in Islamic history, irrespective of your Shia, your Sunni, your whichever sect or group you belong to, uh, no one ever supports um, or, or think in positive terms about Yazid. People on the streets talking about him, it, it's, it's amazing. And it has happened because in reaction to something that a Shia uh, speaker had said uh, in a very offensive way. But this is just, I'm using it as, as a frame. Things having come down to this point that in a public procession of hundreds of thousands of thousands and thousands, um, somebody can raise 
a slogan in favor of Yazid in a, in a land in South Asia, which, is, which became Muslim because of the Sufi mystics who were all talking about pluralism. Uh, it, it's really a, a very problematic sign. So how do we understand this? And I was thinking, um, why is it, question is, why is it happening now? Um, is it domestic or is it uh, regional? Uh, is state an innocent victim? Or is, is state um, a part and parcel of this crisis um, yet again? Um, I may not have the exact answers in yes or no to this in short time, but I'll touch upon some of the facts. Uh, first and foremost, I think um, we must acknowledge that Pakistan did pretty well in its counterterrorism operations in the last 10 to 15 years. They pushed back Al Qaeda, they pushed back even Pakistani Taliban, and um, the number of suicide bombings that had gone up from 2004 to 2014, in the, those 10 years, they went down. The Pakistani security forces did pretty well. The credit is due to them. However, from a policy angle, I believe that the lessons of those counterterrorism successes were never clearly defined. Um, those forces who were successful never went out to explain to everyone um, what they really had figured out. Why was this happening? And um, how they had pushed this back? Was this a purely military action? Was it um, countering violent extremism? Have they involved religious leaders? Whatever we know is very little because of some research from some extent scholars, but there's no national narrative in Pakistan which explains how they pushed back. So now that there's some resurgence again of, of, of bigotry and extremism that we are seeing, um, there's no way we know what had worked, how we had pushed them back and whether this is just a momentary, moment, a short trans, uh, trans, transitory thing, or is it, is it more serious? Secondly, what, uh, it, and this is a problem not only in Pakistani narrative, but Western narrative as well, and the United States as well, um, as regard when it comes to US policy towards Middle East, we fail to acknowledge that this global extremism network at a more local level has always been sectarian. Whether it was in Iraq, whether it was in Syria, first and foremost, these were very, very sectarian in focus. Then they expanded into um, international terrorism. Um, because for whatever reasons, ignorance, I would say, we never wanted to go in deep into the roots of those. We were more focused on their final shape and form. And we focused on that. We succeeded in some shape or form in certain cases, but we could never cut out the root of where this is happening. That's why in Pakistan, it was not acknowledged that Tehreek-e Taliban Pakistan or Lashkar-e Taiba or Lashkar-e Jhangvi they had their splinter groups, which were extremely um, uh, bigoted. In most cases, very, very anti-Shia. Whether to Jesh Muhammad, a splinter of, uh, of, of major organizations, I don't want to throw out so many names uh, of these militant organizations, but these are quite few in number. They are from South Punjab. These were Punjabi Taliban initially, because it was um, kind of fashionable to call Taliban are an Afghan phenomenon. It was quite late. It took Pakistan 10 years to acknowledge, no, these are our sons of our soil. These are our own kids who have turned uh, against the state, have, have lost their soul. So those factors continue to simmer. Third linked point is this political economy of religious extremism. I can call it political economy of jihad as well, but what I mean is this Deobandi versus Barelvi battlefield. Um, we saw the assassination of Pakistan People's Party leader and governor Punjab, Salman Tasir. His killer's um, uh, grave has become a shrine. It is a pity. It, it is so pathetic for everyone who understands um, the, the Sufi message um, in, in Pakistan and that of pluralism. What was the, really happening? Barelvis had thought that the Obandis are receiving all the funds from Gulf and Middle East. And this is our time to get some funds. And how come we are seen as so much uh, peace loving? They wanted to show their, um, their power and authority. It was their uh, opportunity. Next point, and I know I might have just a couple of minutes left, um, is um, linked to whether state is involved or not. Um, because this religious political economy or the political economy of religious extremism stays. Um, um, Pakistan had built up NECTA, National Counterterrorism Authority. It is a good organization with uh, co cohesion. We see cohesion of police, intelligence, um, other organizations. But again, 
whether the Pakistani head of counterterrorism is also sitting on the table where head of the Pakistani intelligence is sitting or the head of the Pakistani military sitting, I doubt it. I have not seen it in any of the pictures. So we have not incorporated in Pakistan the lessons of their successes of counterterrorism. My very last point is as regards state, the worry is, is it again that Pakistani state has started hiring some of these militant organizations which are promising them they will do something good in, uh, good in their context in India, uh, in Kashmir, or in Afghanistan, now that Taliban are coming back into prominence, that Pakistani interlocutors are important, jamaat e ulama islam and others. Um, I hope not. When I asked this question to a friend in Pakistani government, they said, well, the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, um, sort of democracy is on our head. We can't be doing this. So what I have concluded, and that's what my conclusion is, it is basically incompetence of the highest level by the Pakistani state. They are living um, in their self-imposed darkness, and this is giving them benefit of doubt uh, because this phenomenon is so new. Maybe it will go away. Um, and that, that, with that, I will close because I know I'm 10 minutes, and there are so many other points I would like to talk about. But that's where I will close. From a policy perspective, the sectarianism is very threatening because it is going to empower religious extremists who are going to push for terrorism in Pakistan again. State, at the least should be blamed for its total incompetence and its lack of focus. Uh, if we see this continuing, we will start thinking state is playing its dirty hand again, which it has done. And we have evidence of that. Thank you. Ali, you're muted. Yeah, thank you very much for those, uh, for those remarks. And of course, pointing out that Maybe this is not about religion. This is about the failure of the state and state-related things rather than some intrinsically religious issue. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Noshin Ali for her remarks. Thank you. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but one comment for the attendees. Uh, just know that if you have any questions from our panelists, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and uh, once we're in the Q and A uh, session, then uh, uh, you're, you're, you're hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll be able to address some of your questions. Sorry, Nishin. Not at all. Thank you, Dr. Payam, for uh, giving us a platform to come together and discuss this very painful issue. Um, the last month, watching where Pakistani politics has gone, um, is as Professor Hassan Abbas was commenting. We are seeing. We've seen this exacerbating over a long time uh, post, in post-colonial Pakistan, but um, there are certain aspects of it that feel unprecedented. However, I want to historicize this moment a little bit as continuing with what Professor Abbas has done for us. And I want to start with a personal example. So in 1994, my best friend, who's Isna Shri Shia, her mamu, uh, her uncle was killed in a targeted assassination in Sargoda. And that was my first understanding of something called like, you know, the state project, uh, sectarian privilege at the top, what it meant at an intimate level of family suffering. This is 1994, I'm 14 years old. And for those of us who are, have lived in Shia neighborhoods or have deep friendships with Shia communities, have taught Shia students, have Shia colleagues um, and Ismaili colleagues and Hindu colleagues um, and Ahmadi colleagues, you know, these tragedies are interlinked. We know they are linked through shared processes. So I want to draw that connection um, at the outset. So we go, as Bina will outline later as well, from high profile target killings in the 90s. Then, I mean, I'm going to make a few jumps here, but I also want to talk about Gilgit Baltistan, where my scholarship on sectarian violence is focused. Gilgit Baltistan is not constitutionally part of Pakistan, yet it's internationally considered as part of disputed Kashmir and is a Shia majority political unit in Sunni dominated Pakistan. We have seen in 1970 stated official state policies of breaking secular nationalist will and organization through divide and conquer tactics. 
This is often called uh, by my interlocutors in Gilgit Baltistan as calculated disorder along sectarian lines. So we have enforced uh, an annihilatory politics of sectarian violence. I mean, I agree with Professor Abbas and I'll get to the terminology later as well, where we use both sex. This was what was done in Gilgit Baltistan that loudspeakers were installed, khuli ijazate mili thi, ke when you create a law and order situation, you disrupt possibilities of regional political solidarity, right? Especially in a disputed border area. And what you do is that you can then represent those citizens, 1.2 million of them, as irrational, as over emotional, as being misled by these uncompromising ulema, right? So the ground reality, the citizenship question, right of political rights is trumped by the securocratic interests of the state and that was linked to what the pakistani military state had already done in dhaka we know about al badr we know about al shams we know that religious terror has been used as a state tool within pakistan prior to the cold war and that's a very important uh, point to make so we have Gilgit Baltistan since the 70s. So I'm, I'm drawing in Dhaka in Gilgit Baltistan to continue our emphasis on seeing this as not unprecedented, uh, what has happened last month in Karachi. Now I'm going to fast forward to Karachi, which is where I'm from and I've grown up. We, there is, there's this apathy towards anti-Shia violence. Imam Barga, okay, hota hi rata hai. Again, like Professor Hassan was saying, Sectarianism hai, bahir se hai, it's come from outside, it's both sides. Or why should we talk about Shias? Uh, all lives matter. Everybody is dying uh, in terrorist violence. So we see a lot of ways in which the central question of Sunni privilege is completely overridden. You will have to try to find scholarship on Pakistan that takes a Sunni privileging state project as the core of Pakistani nationalist ideology seriously and, and extensively. Because we have gotten used to saying, oh, there was um, uh, the Sunni Shia party, the Sunni party and the Shia party, and both were killing each other. Okay. So I want to talk about between 2012 and 2017, just to give some figures, 25 Imam Bargas were attacked, more than 2,000 people were killed. The Hazara ethnic group, Hazara Shias were whole scale attacked in Quetta and in other parts of Balochistan. But I also want to link it to um, post 2009, so over the last decade, we've had more than 18 attacks on Sufi shrines. I also want to link it to post 2007, we've had more than 400 schools, girls schools attacked in Pakistan. What, what is going on here? So what I'm trying to suggest is that violent sexism and violent what I would call, and I have called in, a, in an upcoming publication, sectism, which is defined as anti-Shia racism, anti-minority racism. Sectarianism is just a way to do both sides. Sectarianism does not recognize it's a false equivalence that doesn't recognize the reality of how much Sunni militancy is backed by the Pakistani state, right? And when you have Imam Bargas, when you have whole buildings being attacked, uh, we, we, need to, we need to also ask why our categories were never there in the first place. For example, Zia's project is called Islamization. It's called Islamization in Park Studies. It's called Islamization in all literature. I've called it Islamization for a long time. It's a Sunni dominant project. Why don't we call it Sunniization, right? I mean, this is the way in which uh, this abstract notion of Islam coded as Sunni becomes normalized. So everything else is particular. It's, it's um, non, you know, uh, it's, it's a Shia perspective or it's, it's not, it doesn't have the claim uh, to, to academic objectivity. So, To give you an example of why violent sexism and violent sectism are linked, this is taking seriously uh, as a feminist, connecting the sect and gender questions, which is not often done. I'll give you an example from three weeks ago. A friend of mine who's Sunni was in Sadr 
uh, in Karachi. And you know, she had tied some scarf around her head, was with her Shia friend. Both of them were there to fix some, some technical stuff. Um, and the person who was there, the technician at the uh, uh, Dukan, sorry, I'm trying to speak in English here. Um, he said to her, why have you taken the headscarf like this? Are you Kadiani? And another public intellectual in Sindh, who has recently been accused of blasphemy, uh, the violence against her, the, the criminal and hate-centered violence against her that, was, that, took all, that took over Twitter, that took over all over Pakistan, was constantly focusing on how she's Kadiani, which she's not, and, and both were Sindhi. And what I'm trying to state here is, is that the otherizing that happens is a no woman, no Sufi, no Shia, no minority, no music, very hardcore fundamentalist vision, right? And that's why we need to, we need to look at this as a violent religio-political project. And I call it an annihilatory project, okay? In which all of us are, all of these questions are linked. So I'm not sure where I'm doing on time, but I wanted to, Ali, unmute, tell me. Well, you've got about one, one, two minutes left. So. One or two minutes, okay. okay. Um, I, I asked Ali ke if I if you ask me to speak, maybe I will I will just it will be hard because I have three chapters on my book on Gilgit Baltistan. I have a lot to say on how this sectarian politics has particularly been resisted in Sindh by feminists, by Sufis, by progressives, uh, where I'm from, and in Gilgit Baltistan, where I've spent uh, a lot of time um, doing research. But let me end with the racism point. I mean, those of us who have grown up Shia, who know that being called kafir at age 10 is absolutely normal. I mean, this burden of majoritarian questioning that uh, people from Shia households have to face right from an early age is not very well known. Actually, it's neither acknowledged in academic discourse, nor is it widely talked about. Because again, like Professor Abbas was saying, Sectarianism is sort of up there, no? it's like dual political, it's like a political issue, it's an issue of regional geopolitics. People don't see that this is an intimate reality for a lot of people who have, who might have actually not been Shia. There are people whose names are Nakvi and uh, Raza who are discriminated against and then they wake up to the fact, oh, I'm being looked at as, as Shia. So the examples there for those who do not know and who have not lived this reality is not accepting food from Shia neighbors, thinking that Shias are Hindus, so should be disassociated with, not attending funerals of Shias. These are just three very basic examples. I can, I can give countless more. But the most recent case that has happened over the last um, four weeks is the escalation of blasphemy cases against Shias, more than 100 people from what I know, lists are being passed around in Sakhar. The protests in Karachi that we saw in which thousands were participating, 10 minutes from where I have lived all my life, have not ended in Sakhar in Northern Sindh. So the use of blasphemy as a tool to criminalize Shia thought is, is a very devastating move. And I want to say that this anti-minority politics, which I would like to say is, is a racial politics as well, not just religious politics, not just state politics. Um, calls for, uh, in terms of solutions, I would like a feminist politics that takes an openly anti-sectist stance as well. And I write more about anti-sectist feminist politics and the need for that, uh, and we'll share the link later. Thank you, I'll end there. Well, thank you so much for your uh, comments, Nosheen, and of course, pointing out, of course, that this, in a certain way, you know, I think it's one of the problems with nationalism as an ideology. You have to constantly keep on inventing the other because nationalism thrives on othering people. 
And so you define who's the nation and then people who don't fit the nation are then seen as the enemies of the state. And this is a problem, I think, worldwide with nationalism per se, but here we are seeing it take this particular turn, especially when the Pakistani nation state gets defined under Zia, you know, in a Sunni, privileging Sunni perspectives. So anyway, well, uh, let me turn it over now to Bina. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Asani, um, uh, Dr. Mosini, Hassan Abbas, Noshin Ali. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. And um, to, to the Weather Head Center for this really topical, timely thing. I think some of the points we've, that have been made are really very pertinent, especially the point about sectarianism and about the othering and uh, Sunni, privileging the Sunni um, viewpoint. I actually, if I may share my screen, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about, to sort of contextualize a lot of what Hassan Abbas and Noshin Ali have said. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess what I say will be kind of linked up with that, but maybe I give a little bit more, another perspective and add a little bit more to their very, very lucid and very intelligent, I think, uh, presentation. So if I may share my screen, I don't know if I have the presentation to do that. Um, I actually, um, so, oops, sorry. I just wanted to play this. Um, so I just wanted to sort of start out by my personal story, which is my parents, my, uh, who, got, who got married in 1962. My father was a Sunni, my mother a Shia, and that I think makes me a Sushi, which I learned, a term I learned uh, while I was researching this issue. But then, you know, at that time, identities were more fluid, I think, when you were growing up, Noshin, from what you were talking about in the 19th, and before, you know, at that time, people, there were, it was a lot more intermarriages and uh, things like that. And then, of course, then there's the whole geopolitical factors that Hassan Abbas has touched upon a little bit, Pakistan being a frontline state, the proxy wars. And of course, I agree completely with uh, what Hassan said, that it's not just that something come from outside. We have had these divisions within the country always. Um, but then, you know, as you talked about, you know, the, the Zia years, the first, I think what we're seeing right now really links the trajectory from that first Afghan so-called jihad, the project of, uh, you know, like turning a national war of liberation into a religious war, uh, uh, taking what uh, Dr. Iqbal Emma um, uh, called terrorism theirs and ours in his uh, talk at the Bo University of Boulder, uh, Colorado at Boulder in 1998. Um, I don't know if you can see the screen where I've got that um, book, uh, pamphlet of Dr. Iqbal Ahmed called Terrorism, Theirs and Ours, in which he talked about, when you, when you talk about terrorism, then, you know, look, at, he talked about the state and the state engaging in acts of terrorism and how basically uh, unconstitutional, illegal acts of violence will backfire and we we, we are seeing that. So I just wanted to make these linkages a little bit. And um, Noshin already, already talk about, talked about this. All of you also mentioned this. And I want to bring up this um, notion of takfir that has really uh, taken up in Pakistan. Takfir means to create divisions. And it means to literally to call uh, somebody a kafir or an infidel, that, that othering we talked about. And uh, non-Muslim, calling somebody a non-Muslim versus their affirming their identity as Hindu or Ahmadi or Shia or whatever they call non-Muslim. And that, of course, links to this whole question of blasphemy that Noshin brought up. And that is linked to this whole uh, issue of nationalism, that this ultra hyper nationalism that we've been seeing. So now it's been conflated where you are on the one hand called a blasphemer, labeled as a blasphemer like Salman Tassi was. And then on the other hand, you're you know, also called a traitor and you're charged with sedition and the whole notion of patriotism gets linked with who is uh, the, the right kind of Muslim. The, the right Sunni kind of Muslim is the only one who's a patriot and everybody else becomes 
perpetrator. And that I think is literally this kind of fascist politics that we are seeing all over the world really right now, including in India, we are seeing that. We're seeing that in America. Um, I just wanted to very quickly go through this. You know, I think that we've talked about um, General Zia and um, Benazir Bhutto. I'd, but when you look at the timeline of Pakistan, and uh, Hassan very uh, brought up this issue of India, and so did Noshin. Um, and if you look at these decades that we've had, um, where we've had some kind of uh, political overseeing, and then we've had like a decade of army rule, and then there's a war with India and all these. Uh, phases. Um, and then even in 1973, when Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto comes in, the Second Amendment to the Constitution declares Ahmadis as non-Muslims, and you have the Islamic summit, which is, you know, appeasing these, that constituency. And you have also, I think, just to go back a little bit, I remember what a, uh, he was a former Attorney General of Pakistan said at a seminar at, in, in Karachi organized by the HRCP, the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan, and he said that actually maybe the rot goes back to before General Zia, to before the Second Amendment, uh, to before that, to the objective resolution. Um, right after uh, Mr. Jinnah, after Kaidazam passed away, he would never have allowed that, as uh, uh, Ali pointed out. He, he, his vision for an inclusive Pakistan would never have made space for something like the objective resolution that declared Islam to be a state religion, as if a state can have a religion. You know, it's only people that can have. I think a state cannot have it. Pakistan and Israel are the only you know, self-declared uh, states that have declared themselves as religious ent entities. And then you had uh, the, the, Zia, the Zia years with that Islamized, so-called Islamization, which you Noshin know, very correctly pointed out with the Sunniization, actually, and the anti-women legislation in the name of Islam, the anti-minority legislation in the name of Islam, and the two, 295 um, of the, of the penal code, the British era law that has expanded under the years to include more offenses, including those punishable by death. And that law remained pending for a while until actually, you know, in 1993, 94, when all, when the time that you started to, uh, you know, get consciousness of this, when the law, when the blasphemy law uh, was when the option of life imprisonment under 295C lapsed, uh, 295C being uh, in, uh, for um, any kind of disrespect to the Prophet of Islam, may peace be upon him. Any kind of disrespect to the Prophet of Islam uh, came under 295C, which was punishable by uh, life imprisonment or death. And in 1993, that law lapsed. Um, the, the life imprisonment option lapsed and became only punishable by death. And that's when the spate of blasphemy murders, what we could call blasphemy murders, began at that time. Um, the first one being a Christian teacher, actually, in Jaisalabad, Nemat Emmer, um, who had actually seen that you're going to, into Urdu, Noshin. Um, he had written, he had, uh, the posters came up uh, accusing him, ke ye, uh, that he is, he is saying that the prophet, Bakriya Nazubillah, Churaya karte the, churaya and charaya. I mean, zair zabar ka farak hai. The posters that came up said that, you know, uh, Muslims, please guard your children against this uh, Christian teacher who is teach, telling your, telling your, uh, your children that the prophet, God forbid, uh, used to steal goats as opposed to graze goats. It's just that Urdu little, you know. Anyway, that's another whole long thing about 295C. And then we had the, you know, um, just uh, that all that happened after uh, the Sharif government uh, was dismissed and the Benazir Bhutto government was elected. And again, we had um, the Kargil war with India. So every every phase we have, we've seen that the rise of uh, this kind of, uh, I guess, fascist mentality coincides with like this nationalist fervor and war against. And then you have, you know, another decade of Musharraf, the military government, and the so-called enlightened moderation in which he was running with the hares and hunting with the hounds. And then you have Benazir Bhutto being assassinated days before the general elections and then uh, the elections that took place. And then you actually had that political process continue. And then you see suddenly a rise when the political process again begins. You again see that rise in sectarian killings, in quotes, and blasphemy the issue, um, Asia BB in 2010, and then you have, but, and yet you have the first peaceful transfer of power from one elected government to the other, 
And then, you know, that happens despite two elected prime ministers being dismissed. And under the next government, again, you have two elected prime ministers being dismissed. And again, the wave of sectarian, the so-called uh, killings begins. And then there's another tr peaceful transfer of power, which, and we have the current dispensation, which is the closest to the security establishment that any elected government in Pakistan has ever been. Um, so just want to go back to the of years and just after that and his so-called enlightened moderation and uh, I, I like the term that Noshin that you used uh, of um, uh, annihilation and I think a term that I came across that I want to use is intellecticide that has been going on for a long time and in, in the 1990s I remember I wrote a piece about that about the uh, the target killing of Shia doctors at that time in 1993-94 and now we are seeing it again and so this intellecticide is something that I came across, actually, believe it or not, in a Communist Party of Pakistan press release after one of their members was killed in the northern areas, in the tribal areas. Um, but it's very, it's, this, this allows for a lot of plausible deniability also. You know, we don't know who's doing it, all these freelance snipers, assassins. And yes, I completely I agree with Hassan that the Barelvi, uh, you know, sort of uh, bid for power by killing Salman Tassil. Um, and then, of course, that also, I think, coming to Noshin's point about girls and girls' educations in the Hadar attack on Malala Yousafzai, and this is actually a demonstration in Karachi in support of Malala. Um, I'll just very quickly go through these. Uh, in, in, in 2012, just around that time, soon after Malala was targeted, you have a spate of target killings of uh, Shia uh, Pakistanis. Um, just, I, I just put together some of these. Uh, some time ago for another presentation. This is Dr. Riyal Hussain Shah, um, and who was shot dead outside his clinic. Um, my friend Irfan in uh, Quetta, who was killed um, as part of the Shia, of, of the Hazara targeting that Noshin referred to, um, the Hazara town. In so many Hazara killings at that time, in, at that time, 2013, 14, from 12 to 14, um, in the Dr. Ali uh, Heather and his son, 10-year-old, uh, 12-year-old son Murtaza, um, a bus down Karachi that Noshin referred to, uh, a bomb blast that killed over 45, including 20 children. Um, and then the target killing, not just targeting of not just those accused of blasphemy, but those who were fighting for them, the lawyer Rashid Rahman in Multan, who was representing the blasphemy accused, the Fulbright Scholar Junaid Hussein, and our friend Sabin Mahmood um, for being too liberal, uh, spread uh, going, the, Going against this narrative that both uh, previous speakers have talked about, countering this narrative of what Pakistan should be, of what, what kind of a state it should be. Um, I just wanted to end by this sort of, I think, Noshin, you're completely right. We need a feminization of politics and we need to, basically, I just put together a list of all these entities in Pakistan that basically need to do their work Parliament needs to legislate. The governments need to, you know, act against people. The judici judiciary needs to, con uh, to, you know, hand down convictions. The political leaders need to disassociate from these platforms. Uh, the police need to uphold the law. The intelligence agencies need to do their job and stop protecting those, uh, and stop and, and to stop protecting those who are guilty of these things. The media needs to exercise responsibility and agree on a code of ethics. But of course, as you probably most of you know, right now the media is under. I think probably the most severe censorship that we have seen since the Zia years, perhaps also because there is m much more media now that, than there was uh, during the Zia years. Um, uh, recently, I think something like 43 of over 40 journalists are facing um, cases uh, of sedition and blasphemy. And some years ago, there was another such case in which I was also named. So this has been going on for a while. Um, and right now, the media is really under siege. But the bottom line is that no citizen should have the right to cast aspersions on the faith and beliefs of another or to term anyone a blasphemer or a kafir or a non-Muslim. And that the states and its functionaries must try, you know, must try and act against all acts of vigilante violence as criminal and proceed against them according to law. Because I think that we really have to um, not to stop this culture of, of impunity. So I'll... Oh, yeah. so there. okay, sorry. All right. Okay, so yeah, I just wanted to um, 
end with that. I don't know what just happened. Uh, Thank you Thank for you. putting faces uh, to all the, yeah. the, I mean, more than 2,000 just from 2012 just onwards. Just a few. Just and a few. Let's also talk about how the, there is no record. You have to go to protests of Shia missing people. Those protests happen regularly in Karachi uh, and other parts of Pakistan. And this, I mean, this project of counting the victims is also something that we need to talk about who counts as a victim, who counts as, you know, random, you know, encounter. So, so thank you, especially for that. Okay, so thank you very much for this. And now we'll sort of uh, open up for um, some uh, questions. Uh, but one of the things that I, you know, struck me is, you know, in listening to all of this, you know, all your presentations is, of course, on the one hand, we are talking about, the, you know, in a certain way, you know, failing to define the state in, a, in pluralistic and inclusive terms, which was Jinnah's vision, you know, that the state has to be pluralist in nature and it's sort of flipped and it's become exclusivist in nature. So it's a kind of exclusive, so I don't know, it's a kind of exclusivist nationalism as opposed to be a pluralist nationalism. And some of our, um, one of the, our questions that has come in um, you know, actually tries to connect this with, you know, this whole development with actually what's been happening in the United States as well, you know, as, and, and I think with nationalisms in many parts of the world where they go uh, toxic against the other, you know, against perceived minorities. So the question here is to Professor Abbas that you stated under uh, General Ziaul Haq, the country of Pakistan changed radically would you agree that Zia could not have done it alone and was aided and abetted by senior leaders in the country, just as certain GOP leaders are aiding and abetting President Trump in the USA now? Thank you for the question. Of course, Zia could not have managed it by himself. Um, but as we say in Pakistan and many of the developing countries, at times individuals, leaders um, have huge influence. Um, as the whole argument is, I'm rem reminded of uh, Professor Aisha Jalal's, my teacher's book, uh, Jinnah, the sole spokesperson. spokesperson. Um, the, the idea that without Jinnah, there would have been no Pakistan, and one would argue, no, there were many others as well, the whole political party. So in, in this sense, J Ziaul Haq, um, his policies and his worldview associating his politics and his survival um, with this kind of religious worldview that was very sectarian, which was very takfir. When I was so right, this whole notion of takfir had, has, a, has had a huge, huge impact. But I want to link this with one other factor which helped Ziaul Haq, which is this overall deterioration of religious discourse. I think with all the due respect, um, and as a pr proud practicing Muslim, I think the, the crisis that is faced by the Muslim religious discourse may be more acute than other religious religions in comparison, because different religions are at a, at a different uh, stage of their cy cycle in history. What I mean by that is the uh, religious textbooks in most of our religious institutions in madrasas, uh, which were used in the uh, 1980s, um, the number of madrasas had increased um, and of course, Zia single-handedly or no single intelligence agency could have changed the texts um, of these uh, institutions. The texts were there. No one could have touched them. They are very, very particular, very, very, uh, they, they, they own that narrative. And that narrative on all sides, if I may say, on all sides is so problematic and is so narrow. I would like to mention here uh, on some of uh, one issue that has gone wrong um, or problematic in the, on the Shia side as well. Currently, when I say the political economy of uh, religiosity or political economy of religious education, in Pakistan, there's a huge debate among the Shias between what they call Zakirs. The Zakirs are these um, uh, 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 folks who, are, who more believe in rhetoric, who, who are very good speakers, Khatibs, versus the ulema who, who have a degree from Qum or from Najaf or from a major religious institution. The debate between them has become a debate between what in the religious references called between Ghalis and Mukassirs. Uh, 
the problem in the most recent problem also was triggered by a Shia by a Shia speaker um, who said terrible things about the first three caliphs. He he said very very offensive stuff, which is absolutely prohibited according to the leading Shia scholars. He said that that was um, live telecasted or that was on YouTube. That empowered the Sunni extremists on the other side. I'm just giving it as an example. And uh, when you go deeper into this, what is happening within the Shia context about this debate? It's all about how much money you make um, when going to a religious uh, event. So um, the religious discourse has become very, very sectarian internally um, within the Shias as well. Sunnis uh, on the Sunni side, it is, with all respect, much worse. Um, with with the Deobandi versus Barelvi versus Ahli Hadith versus Wahhabi, these debates and challenges were there. When what Zia did was Zia politicized these, and empowered some of the groups at the cost of others. That empowerment um, is what caused the crisis today in Pakistan. Thank you. I just want to add just one quick thing there. Just taking uh, taking what you said further, uh, Hassan, is that it's not just that it's these these organizations, these um, the the so-called sectarianism within. The, within the religious communities, the blasphemy law, so-called blasphemy law, we say blasphemy law, again, that's a kind of a lazy term, just like sectarianism is, because the blasphemy law isn't really all about blasphemy. There's, you know, just, it's basically disrespect to various aspects of religion, the holy book or holy sites or whatever, holy personages. But about half of the so-called blasphemy cases registered in Pakistan are registered against uh, like I think it's roughly half an hour again by Muslim by one sect of Muslims against another, and then the other half is disproportionately against those who are non-Muslim. That is, who are not considered like Ahmadis, um, Hindus, Christians, um, but but and who are of course like you know point whatever small percentage of the population. But half the cases are registered against them. These blasphemy cases, and the other half are by one sect of Muslims against another sect. I just wanted to add that to what you're saying. Very okay, um, so here's another question, uh, um, which I'm just going to pose to any of the panelists. Um, uh, and that regards, you know, since we've been talking about this violence and terrorism and so on, um, have there been any peace building efforts put in place, either from the state or international actors? in response to this rise of sectism? And also, what is the role of civil society in this conflict? If I can very briefly add, and I know my both colleagues are more qualified than I am to talk on, on civil society, I, and because that's a sign of hope as well, from the state side, there was one major effort, which was CVE, countering violent extremism. But to everyone's surprise, um, it was controlled by the state's intelligence agencies. And this is not a secret, this is well known. Maybe they were well-intentioned, but CVE, countering violent extremism cannot be managed by intelligence or police forces. This is a s action from society. The challenge was that most of the counterterrorism funds that went from the West, from us, from as an American, I would say in, of Pakistani heritage from, from Washington DC, most of the counterterrorism funds that were given to Pakistan, given to the state, and state kept it to themselves. The state in its counter-terrorism or counter-narrative building never involved the civil society. So there were some choreographed efforts, calling it Pagama Pakistan, which was a good effort. The message came out was good, but it was all, you were cutting a check of dollars in most cases um, to, to the well-known um, scholars um, who are uh, kind of on the state's payroll and they are projecting your message. So, so the message, of peace even was discredited because it was coming from one angle. I will give just three names and I would highly encourage our uh, other audience also to look them up, who I think are giving an outstanding example of how peace building can happen. Uh, one is the leading Sunni scholar, Deobandi scholar uh, uh, with background, Tariq Jamil. Um, yes, some of the things he would say, none of us would agree, but the way he has tried to brought the Shias and Sunnis together um, is, is an amazing feat. Another scholar among the Sunnis um, who actually has raised the slogan by saying, I am neither a Shia nor a Sunni nor a Wahhabi nor a Sufi. 
and the number of people who are subscribing to his channel are in hundreds of thousands. His name is Mirza Muhammad Ali, and he has mastered um, the Sunni books as well as Shia books, mostly Sunni books. He's making an argument about, um, I'll not go into deep, deep into it, but something which brings the Shias and Sunnis and Deobandis and Barilvis together. A phenomenal effort without any funding or support, which is gaining strength and becoming a movement of in, its, in itself, explaining the power uh, of, of, of the message of peace um, for ordinary Muslims. Last but not the least is the Shia scholar uh, Jawad Nakvi, who is running a major center in Lahore, who's challenging the Shia extremists from within, who are saying things which are offensive to an extent that they empower the, 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 the Sunni extremist on the other side. So there are too many examples, but these three came to my mind, which I thought uh, must be mentioned. Thank you. I can add um, a little bit to, to that question. I think um, social consciousness in Sindh and Gilgit Baltistan particularly, but also elsewhere in Pakistan itself resists this kind of reduction, right? So the, uh, Hasanji, what you were saying about I'm neither this nor that. I mean, you find it in Bullesha, you find it all throughout our poetic discourse. In fact, there's a wonderful tradition in Gilgit Baltistan where Halka Erbab Zog, Bazme Ilmofan, literary societies have organized conferences called Hussein Sabka. Hussein is for everybody. Because what we are seeing now in Pakistan, you know, they've dealt with it and they've dealt with it superbly well considering the kind of militarism and coercive colonization they have experienced at multiple levels, right? No proper judiciary, no representation in parliament, no real decision making uh, and non-local rule imposed on them for, for a very long time. So what we find is that the Sunni poets will glorify Shia leaders, Shia imams as a sign of countering Tasub. Tasub is the local word for sectarianism that I often came across. Tasub means prejudice. And they're very clear that the state project, right, in the name of Islam has been one not just of hypocrisy, right, but of hate. Um, and they're very clear that the kind of Muslim homeland that we aspired for was not what we see th this kind of political extremism. And I want to signal here that you know, who are these peace building projects targeted towards? Are we, if the problem is military extremism, if the problem is that we've become an intelligence republic, if the problem is that right, left and center, dissent is wiped out and it's a very fascist politics that we have bred and nurtured in which majoritarian Sunni privilege has had a role to play, right? Then what kind of at the level of discourse, we need to make the shift as well, right? And I'm very grateful, Bina. I'm just going to reinforce two points uh, that you put forward. I'll also plug chapter four of my book is all about poetic resistances to sectarianism. Um, Bina, the points that you made are very critical about Jesse political process charta hai, the moment you have semblances of democracy, we see all these attacks happen. I mean, I'm not making a very direct link, but we are seeing this repeatedly where sedition, being a traitor, is being used um, in an anti-blasphemy, uh, in a blasphemy framework as well. It's a, it's a phenomenal point and it's a very significant point that the Bajwa files come out and there's a hue and cry in Pakistan and we suddenly have these massive um, protests. Of course, Mohram was also happening. I mean, these things collaborate, but we know from the history of Pakistan and Gilgit Baltistan, that at specific moments when uh, political resistance take root, as we see today with the PTM and, and with other movements, we see the religion card suddenly cropped up to create law and order situations. I think we need to say that um, up front. We need peace building towards that excess um, as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And uh, thank you, Noshin, for flagging those points. And uh, speaking of Bajwa files, actually, that is exactly around when these so-called sedition cases against journalists began to be registered 
um, I think something like 40, like I said, um, any, uh, there's complete censorship, like I said before. You mentioned PTM, for those who don't know, that's the Pashtun uh, Tahafuz movement of young people. And I wrote a piece about it some a couple of years ago. The title of it was a youth-led social move social media powered movement uh, is censored or something like that. It was published in Scroll in India. And uh, so you don't, if you don't, if you're not on social media, you wouldn't know, or if you didn't have a Pashtun connection, you wouldn't know that this is happening. And their uh, mokif, uh, their, their uh, raison d'etre is that they're saying we are not Taliban. We are not, you know, stop stop giving us our guns and arms, you know, the Pashtun youth in the, border, in the border areas between Pakistan and Afghanistan, again, linking back to what I said about the first Afghan war and that trajectory that we are seeing that has come right here, that has come right now, and we are at this point right now, more than 20, 30 years later. And they are saying, we, are, we want books, not guns. And if you are not on social media or you don't have personal connection, you wouldn't even know that it's happening because you don't. There are no reports on TV. They are not allowed to be reported on the on the newspapers. In the beginning, there were a couple of their uh, members are in parliament also, but they are given very little time and they are you know really very badly treated. I don't know how they got into parliament. I think just to show that oh we are so open and whatever. But I think um, and the other thing I just wanted to. Sh uh, like you, you were asking about the, what, uh, what is countering this. I think your point about women is a really, really important one. I think the feminization of politics is what counters this. And our Sufi poetry, our literature, it is a, fem it is a feminist because it is very often in the feminist, uh, is, they speak in the feminist way. Um, our identities were not so binary, this or that. Identities were much more fluid before, like I started out by saying. And now you have, so, you know, the, 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 uh, at the Mazar, they wear gurus on their feet, uh, which are the women's, you know, the, uh, to, to dance. And uh, so there's this androgynous, androgyny uh, in, the, in the Sufi shrines, which is also they want to get rid of and they want to masculinize politics, religion, society. And I think when you see the Aurat March, you see the thousands of young women who, who came out. I think my, I, the hope I see is in the young people of Pakistan. And these are not, I'm not talking about the educated English medium elite, no, because they are more interested in parties and you know, their own you know, uh, having fun. But I'm talking about ordinary people who are, you know, ordinary young people who even if they get a smattering of education, they are saying, why can't we have peace with India? Why are we being given guns? Why are, why are girls not being allowed to study? There's this thing in Pakistan that, oh, parents don't want their girls to study not true. It may have been the case many years ago. Now, parents don't want their girls to study only if they can't get them to a nearby school. It's not because they don't want them to study. It's because there's no schools with toilets where their girls can go close by. It's these kind of things. And some, uh, you know, just after Salman Tasir was killed, we started this, uh, we had actually already just started this organization, this lobby group called the Citizens for Democracy. And soon after he was killed, we held these seminars in, uh, in Karachi. And it was a really difficult time. It was very scary. Like Hassan said, you know, Kadri, Mumtaz Kadri was being deified. And people like us were feeling threatened. But um, just around that time, some of my colleagues, if I can just share these photographs from that time that I just found, I just looked for them and I found them. If I can just share them really quickly. Um, so they just, they, they organized this postcards uh, for, um, this was a reference we had, uh, I just want to uh, answer, sorry, I'm trying to, uh, so, so they, they had this open thing where they went there and they said that they were, they were talking about uh, this thing at the back of the, you know, the, this for human, anyway, I think I'm going on. I just want to show you these photographs. They were, these are ordinary people who signed um, something like um, 15,000 uh, letters, you know, again, against calling for restraint to these um, blasphemy, to this kind of violence in the name of religion. These were ordinary people. Um, 15,000 signatures in one day they got. I just wanted to share that. Um, I'll just try to, I'm trying to stop my, you can, can someone mute me so I can, 
I don't know how to. Bina screen ke upper likha hoga. Can you stop share? Okay, so um, let me see if we can change the screen. Let me try to see if I can uh, see if you are there. Yeah, there we are. Okay, all right. So um, thank you for those comments. And actually, it, you know, this thing about this this issue that you talked about gender is very interesting to me because this idea of feminization or feminine Islam versus, you know, the Islam of women and the, and this hyper-masculinized Islam. It reminds me actually of, a, of an interesting article that C.M. Naeem, Professor C.M. Naeem uh, wrote a column. This was several years ago. Um, he was a, uh, he's a, he was a, he retired as a professor of Urdu and Islam at University of Chicago. And he, narrates in this that how he, um, you know, after one of his classes on Islam that he taught in, uh, at University of Chicago, uh, some young men came up to him and asked him what kind of uh, Muslim he was and whether he prayed five times a day. This was at the university. And these were of course people from a Muslim background. I assume they were from the subcontinent and so Professor Naeem sort of reflects on this, on this incident by go going back to his childhood where he said he was raised basically by his mother and his grandmother and he learned Islam, you know, from them, you know, the, and he recalled an event in his childhood where um, they had a uncle of theirs who was Shia, uh, if I remember the story correctly, and it was time to pray or something and the Shia uncle of them did not join. And so, uh, so CM Naeem, the young CM Naeem went, you know, naively to this, to his uncle and said, why didn't you join us for prayer? And his grandmother called him over and, you know, really told him off and said, you never ever ask somebody such a question. It's not permitted. And he said he remembers that because he said, this is the way I was taught, you know, this, this kind of Islam that, you know, we talk about and you see it in the poetry, um, you see it in the popular culture where you talk about, you know, many of these poets talk, you know, we are neither Hindu nor Muslim, we are not Shia, not, but they're really talking about that these differences that we see are more societal and ideological, um, and more materialistic, that underlying all of this is a spiritual un unity, a spiritual reality that actually unites everyone. So this othering that is taking place at the political level, the literary discourse is that actually of humanizing. So what in a certain way at the political level is being dehumanized in the level of literature and the arts and so on is being humanized. And so that's where I think there is this you know, there's this interesting rhetoric um, dynamic that's going on between what Pakistani's literary and performative traditions say about how you cope and how you engage with difference. Uh, and much of it also connected with discourses connected to uh, the use of the woman symbol in some of these poet, Urdu, uh, Punjabi poetry, Sindhi poetry, and so on, as opposed to what you're seeing today at the level of the state. And I can't help thinking, of course, about the, the program for what if for better or for worse, we have Coke Studio, uh, however it's been commercialized. But what is very interesting about the program is that it presents a very different vision because it highlights the literary mode. It presents a very different vision in which people can engage with diversity and pluralism without getting stuck in the, in the issues of sectarianism. Okay, so that's just a comment I wanted to share. Um, another question uh, is, um, you know, the Pakistan government 
and the international community has sadly remained eerily silent on this issue. And yet we keep on highlighting that the government needs to act. So there's a problem here is that how do we as a citizenry organize ourselves and what do we do to accomplish this in the sense that people are thinking, okay, this level, this has to take place at the state level. But if the state is not acting uh, and if you start acting on your own, you might get in trouble with the state. So people are in, in this dilemma. So what do you suggest? I mean, I'm just considering, you know, what your viewpoints on this would be. If I may briefly share my um, view on this. The reality is that there, there is a um, regional context to all of this as well. Although, as I argued, in my humble view, um, Pakistan, Pakistani state um, and even society tragically has internalized some of these sectarian identities. Um, they have been pushed um, to do that. The religious cleric uh, and the ignorant mullah has the, the, the mosque pulpit in it, their control. So it, it has impacted. It's a country with hardly 50% literacy rate. So many people are impacted by the very corrosive, toxic narrative, which is very, very takfir oriented and extremist. And um, yes, out of political correctness, at times we don't say it, but Nosheen is so right. This is um, the kind of a Sunni majoritarian uh, narrative that has uh, taken control. Um, the, 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 most of the Shias in Pakistan and other minorities will not use this word just so that people are not offended, but this is so, so true. Uh, recently, again, anecdotal, but um, uh, this tells us um, a lot of my research and work is on the kind of state side of things and policy oriented. And I was talking to one of the um, important political leaders um, uh, in, in the present government of Imran Khan and his um, attitude, the minister's attitude was, well, this is all Middle East. Uh, this is what uh, this is MBS, uh, um, as it was quoted. Um, and because I'm planning to quote it in op ad, I can take responsibility and quote it here. Uh, he, they said, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, has said to Imran Khan, Well, your country is becoming a Shia, it's becoming a Shia Pakistan. So, what are you doing about it? And that so they, there's all those pressures as well. I, I actually think there might be a conversation, something like that, even if the, the quote is not exact. Um, the, 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 Iran versus we know of how the state has played these things. During the Musharraf years, uh, Pakistani intelligence and others had provided um, space um, to some groups, um, international groups in Balochistan um, for, for signal intelligence collection in, uh, in, Baloch in Iran. Um, this was mentioned in a Washington Post op-ed. Um, th these are facts and this is recently, uh, Pakistan army chief, there was a, there was a, it was again well known. Um, one of the senior most Pakistani army generals uh, who was about to become the army chief was a well-known uh, Shia by name and people know about it. This is not a secret. Um, and he was made chairman joint chief because General Bajwa wanted to stay as army chief. Even that was something interesting, but people said um, uh, that how can a Shia become the army chief? Although in history, Pakistan has had Shia army chiefs, Shia prime ministers, Shia presidents, despite being 15 or 20 percent, whatever figure you mean, Shias have been quite influential in Pakistani politics. So today, in terms of what, what government can do, government is at times blackmailed in Pakistan because of their massive financial challenges from Gulf and Saudi Arabia. If you are taking $6 billion from Saudi Arabia, um, and even if you know for a fact that some of the money has come from a private organizations in Saudi Arabia, for instance, if not state, to a Sunni extremist or jihadist al group, whether you'll have the guts to say this publicly, you will not. Um, and that's the, the new challenge. The Pakistani state is trying to be too politically correct, too cornered. Um, and I uh, would say my last point on this is, I think it's the role of Pakistani political parties and they've also failed Pakistan in, in some shape or fashion. Um, they were not as dependent on a sectarian vote. They knew very well what blasphemy law is. In the private conversations, both Veena and Oshin will tell you, uh, and thank you very much for your perspectives, which are so ex important. They know it, and both of you also know many politicians. In private conversations, they will acknowledge the challenge from blasphemy law and others. In parliament, I mean, I've seen Sherry Rahman speak very brilliantly and boldly, but many few people, politicians will speak. What stopped the mainstream 
relatively progressive political parties in Pakistan to push back these dogmatic tendencies. Um, we have not seen that happening. And that's in a way my question to both um, uh, Bina and Oshin as well. Why do you think that has happened? Because that was where the strength or the government policy change should have come from. Thank you. Uh, it should have, it should have, but you know, the issue is so volatile and so sensitive that even so-called religious scholars who, uh, there's a very good series um, by this young man who did this, uh, Arsalan, I forget his full name, who did the series in, in, that was published in Dawn, really deeply investigated uh, many religious scholars and uh, he went into the, to the source materials and many of them admitted to him uh, that, uh, Yes, uh, the, this whole law is wrong. It should not have been brought in. The guy, I think it was Ismail Qureshi, if I'm not mistaken, the lawyer who prosecuted that young boy, Salamat Masi. Um, and again, that was in 1994, I think 94 or 95, and Asma Jahangir was defending his case. Uh, he admitted, and he was the one who got that uh, a life imprisonment option removed from the law from 295C. He was the one who agitated against it by saying that Islam, there is no uh, space. If you are an apost for apostasy, there's only death. But then he uh, admitted, and that is not true. That is a disputed uh, assertion. There are many Islamic scholars who will say that, that, that you know, give them a chance to re repent. The punishment is not death. In Islam, there's so many, many, it's all about forgiveness. Right? It's all about forgiveness and humility and compassion, but all those uh, elements of Islam have been hijacked by these people with their very hard politics. So, and because the Prophet, peace be upon him, is such a revered figure, and that is the one thing anybody can just say anything, that is one thing that you cannot touch. So, I don't know. It's, it's just too sensitive. I mean, they, governments in Pakistan have time and again got blackmailed by these religious extremists, so-called religious extremists. And I'm saying so-called always in quotes because uh, what they are doing is not about religion, it's about politics. It's about power. It's about grabbing power. It's about imposing their way of life onto the general populace. Mm. My sort of just, uh, I think Bina has answered it fairly well, but the point that Bina made earlier about intellecticide. You breathe today at a protest and you are picked up. Mm. Right? There was a moment in Karachi in 2017 when we were at a play about missing people. It was called Chup, which means silence. And during the play, we got a call that a professor friend of ours who had gone to attend a protest of another professor friend from Karachi University being picked up. I mean, this is an absurdist situation where there are three layers of missing happening. We are watching a play about missing people. We are getting a call about someone who's been picked up, who was at a protest about someone who has been picked up. We are living in a completely paranoid, delusional state, right? And. Uh, Professor Abbas, I think the point that you started this conversation with, you know, what is the role of the state? What is the nature of the state? And Professor Asani, you're asking, people are saying, what can, we do about, what can we do about it? Is that we have to link the social and the state discourse. This reality is there at multiple levels and it's a complex reality, but there is a culture of political authoritarianism that has been nourished and that has used uh, religious militancy of, or, and particularly Sunni militancy as a political strategic tool of the state. It has been used elsewhere. It has been used in Pakistan. How will you create a discourse when there is so much censorship and when people who are doing Indo-Pak peace calendars or people who are organizing against uh, sectarianism, Bina, I think Khudai Ali, wo ek jo aapne activist ka naam liya tha, you know, they are young people in the 20s, you know, organizing, doing their bit at a neighborhood level through social media, they are threatened. Now the new electronic crimes and cyber crimes laws are being used against feminists. They are being used against um, anyone having a political opinion. We, we are talking about a very fundamentally like fascist um, uh, state of affairs. Uh, 
the new twist to that as bina and hasan ji might be aware and many of the listeners as well is that if you can't attack activists you make sure that their parents are involved in fake cases you're going to make sure that you're going to break the spirit of anybody who tries to defend human rights in pakistan whether they be shia rights whether they be women's rights whether they be provincial rights all level of rights are haram that is what has what has happened in in very plain words so yes the situation is dire but the political resistance is intense the awareness of this as an overlapping project is is pretty intense and we need to deepen that awareness peace building can only come when you get your uh, discourse right when we have a better understanding of how internal the problem is as most of the speakers have suggested rather than saying ki ye to 14 saal purana hai uh, like it's 1400 years ago or it's afghanistan or it's elsewhere so um there is a i'm going to add something here about someone said in the questions is that we don't see this in india that is not true actually because these are both global national local projects in pakistan it's become a very state led project but um, professor sani you might remember at the conference on well you had organized a conference on bring on interreligious encounter mm-hmm. and fostering dialogue in the diaspora dialogues that may not often be allowed to happen let's say in pakistan and in india today where we had the sajada nasheen of uh, uh, moinuddin chishti's shrine in ajmer khwaja moinuddin chishti's shrine and he said uh, in response to what our conversation was about he said i've gone to mashhad for mohram for a long time this is the first time i believe it was 2014 that i am being asked why are you going to mashhad because you are sunni and he said i was flabbergasted because i've never seen mohram as an as a non sunni thing this kind of blended identity that we see in sindh that we have lived that you really see in gilgit baltistan as well intermarriage is being very common so on and so forth we now have a way in which ali is now seen the veneration of ali is being seen as a shia thing to do we're dividing up the prophet's family in in very novel ways in this kind of version so a shared history is being countered shared ritualistic shared rituals are being countered so we'll have to see that a particular majoritarianism is actually becoming more and more fascist uh, for lack of any other term so we need to the challenge is at multiple levels it's at the level of history it's at the level of society and it's at the level of state Okay. Could I just uh, could I sure. just have just to, just just wanted to add uh, the the point I think both uh, Hassan and Noshin brought mentioned this and I just want to highlight this a little bit the piece with the India the India factor okay now the India factor like this is something and this is something that I have seen in my work as somebody who's been involved with Pakistan India peace building since the 1990s uh, since 1994 95 and I've seen a new generation that has come up now. connected by social media and the way they are completely blind to the hyper national they don't care these young people they want to meet they want to sample each other's food and drink and songs and movies and dance and do tourism and take motor car rallies and cycle across the countries and they just they, they, they don't understand why this is happening and yet and the, and then those who are like noshin like you pointed out they picked up like raza khan in lahore who was organizing the india pakistan peace calendar he was picked up zinat uh, uh, zinat shahzadi is a young woman a uh, freelance journalist social activist who tried to help him who got power of attorney from his mother in bombay and tried to help him she was disappeared for like two i think some more than two years and they both came back miraculously i think they came back both of them maybe because of the up, uproar but Um, i know a young a young woman who was doing her dissertation on peace between india and pakistan she was not allowed to do her dissertation at a, at the at a university in islamabad she was she was resuscitated you know because of the theme of peace i mean so on the one hand they talk about you know uh, that you know how 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 tolerant pakistan is and you know and of course india is showing us completely like and i actually wrote something about this once uh, about what the lessons pakistan can learn from india about the importance of the democratic political process and the lessons india can learn from pakistan about what happens when you bring religion into politics 
And we are really seeing that. Okay, so uh, thank you for those uh, comments. So um, I think we are uh, past time, but I wanted to just um, in a certain way, um, just sort of end with something that I thought because, you know, there's this tension between how Islam, you know, the different ways in which people are invoking Islam. Um, and in one way, you know, we talk about Islam as faith. Islam as how one relates to God and, um, you know, in that sense, you know, Islam as it's taught as it's understood going back, you know, in its history is one of justice, social equity, um, compassion, forgiveness, all those values, tolerance, respect. And I, I would call that the Islam of faith, right? And then there is this other Islam, uh, which is an ideology, you know, and I think what we are finding in it, this is this, this ideology is sort of the inversion of the Islam of faith. So it becomes this ideology. So the Islam of faith is that of, of respect, of tolerance, of freedom. And then this ideological formulation that I think has emerged in Pakistan, but also I think in some other parts, uh, is really an ideology of oppression. You know, so I think that's a very interesting sort of situation, and I know Ziauddin Sardar has talked about this a little bit, but you know, so it's this, is this really about Islam, the Islam of faith? Because when we think about Islam, we think about it as Islam of faith. And we say, how is it that people are doing these things in the name of Islam where it goes against? But I would argue that what we are seeing here is a very different sort of mutation of this that's using the category Islam but in an ideological sense. And this is where I think the majoritarian minority sort of things as, as an ideology of oppression and that gets tied in with nationalism. You know, so, um, and this is, I think the dilemma that we that, you know, we face in Pakistan and I think several other Muslim countries, I think we, I know Payam is here and uh, I wish we had a little bit more time. I'd love to have Payam's perspective on how this kind of viewpoint, you know, fits in in other parts of the, of the Muslim societies in the Middle East. But, you know, maybe that's going to be a topic for another uh, panel. Um, so with that, I wanted to uh, thank all of our panelists for uh, joining us today, uh, the audience for uh, joining us as well. and. And I'm so sorry, there were so many questions and I had a hard time choosing them because they just kept on flowing. And I really apologize for people that I was not able to accommodate all the very, very interesting questions that, that came up. Uh, but thank you for joining us. And thank you again, Payam, for getting us together and organizing this, this event. So uh, we look forward to some more programming and having these discussions, which I think at least we have a platform where we can talk about this, where these kinds of discussions, you know, would not even be allowed in other contexts. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, please, if you haven't signed up on our mailing list, please, please do so, so you can uh, uh, hear about our future events. And we very much uh, look forward to uh, continuing these, these types of discussions. Uh, it was very engaging, very nuanced, and uh, I very much look forward to learning more. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>